Uh, first, uh, the couple of sponsorships. Tonight's cheer is being sponsored once again by Leo and Kapil Shwaeli. Okay, thank you from myself and Yibune. Uh, there's a second sponsorship. A yacht site uh, of Chofa uh, Aleph Ov, of Menach Mendel Ben David, and uh, well, all of them should have an alias neshama. Uh, the schus of the Shia should be for them in Canadian. <coughs> also, this year uh, should be a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Ruvain and Yeshaya Ben Israel. Again, everybody should be successful and healthy, uh, and they should see tremendous atzlocha. Also, Yibona has begun its found fundraising drive to raise funds for family families in need of the upcoming holidays. Who doesn't need money, huh? One percent of the money collected goes directly to these recipients. Very nice. Link can links can be found in the YouTube description box below. Uh, or on the Yibona website. Tiske the mitzvahs. Fine. Okay. Tonight's shear is in many ways very interesting shear. Because I'm going to be s saying ideas which are in many ways are not commonly known. It's interesting. Uh, and um, in many ways, they are remarkable. I mean, they're actually astonishing. And because they deal with the anhogas. You want to speak a little bit louder? Louder? A little bit. You want to bring this closer? That'll help. <coughs> Great. <coughs> and these ideas are very important and they're very powerful. Now, what they do explain is how does God guarantee that Jews, actually it's really every Jew, will have a chilek, a part, in the future world? How does he do it? Because it would seem that this should not happen. He created the world using the concept called din, which means justice. It means if you do act A, you will get act B. If you don't do Act A, you don't get Act B. That's what justice is, right? It's a response to your behavior. And God did create the world that way. And I've spoken about that quite extensively, why that exists and so on. Um, in fact, the, the Gemara says, Anybody who says that God overlooks your behavior, your deeds. Vatran means to mavater, to overlook, right? Yavatra shenoisav, may his years be overlooked. Because even though he may have deserved to live till 98, he's only going to live till 80. Because God says, okay, what's the difference? It's all arbitrary anyway. But it's not. <clears throat> There's an exact cheshben of when, how a person lives. And God knows the cheshben, exactly, you see. Because each person is assigned a task. So therefore, what I want to go into is how does it work, really? How does God interface with people, especially the Jewish people, uh, and Goyim do have a cheshben, obviously involved. How does he do that when mankind has free will, as we will speak about? Because that's the problem. Once you have free will, right, you can do whatever you want. And if you decide you want to destroy your life or not be worthy of the future world, guess what? You can do it. So that's a very interesting concept. How does God get around the fact that mankind is basically directed through free will? So then how does he guarantee anybody anything, right? Because that's what it means. You decide, not him. So that is the question. So I want to try to answer that extensively. 
but especially with a very different understanding of what we will see uh, is one of the greatest um, benefits that God can do for the Jewish people. In fact, it was so dangerous to the Sultan that he tried to stop it, as we will see why, you know. And uh, it's something, actually, it's an event that we're all familiar with, but everybody thinks that they know what it was about, but they don't. And the event that I'm referring to, as I will explain later, is the Akeda, the binding of Isaac, Yitzchak, on the altar, slaughter, right? We all know what the Akeda is. Uh, it's brought up so many times, you see. But uh, what is the real meaning of the Akeda, you see? Anyway, <clears throat> now, what, we, uh, what you have to know, which I have mentioned before, but like I say, I'm a big believer in sequence, organization. You know, if you need some type of information before you get to another piece of information, well, you need to say it, or else you'll be missing something. That's a very important component of understanding the concepts and ideas in Torah. Sequence of ideas. In any case, <clears throat> now we know basically, I'm not going to go into it obviously extensively, but we know what the outer form or the outline of Judaism is really about. And it's not about something that most people are aware of. <clears throat> what God did, right, his existence, that I mentioned, his existence per se, itself. What he did is he created, you see, a universe. Actually, it's a creation which is much larger than the universe, you see. So he created uh, a uh, complete cosmic dimensions of which there are many worlds or realities, is a better word to use, you know. <clears throat> And what he does is he, when he wants to interface with the creation, right, he doesn't want to be seen interfacing. God, in many ways, is a concealed being, very concealed. In fact, ultimately speaking, we have no idea who he is, none. And like it said, you know, anything that you can think will, that will describe him doesn't. There is no word, concept, idea, anything that you could say, this is God. And it's quite shocking, and so on. Because the truth is, God created everything, uh, even concepts, certainly things or objects. He even created the laws of being, and there are laws of being. In philosophy, they're called the transcendental laws of being. You see, for instance, you cannot exist and not exist at the same instant in time. Logical. You can't be and not be at the same time. Who made that? Why is that true? Because that's what God did. He created that concept. You see, that rule that either you exist or you don't exist. There's no middle here. You see, we recognize that, obviously. And that's what he wants, in any case. So therefore, he created what's called emanations, spheres. Now, nobody knows what they are, but they are clearly, uh, they're not even spiritual, really. They're just dynamic entities that can create realities. That's a very important concept. Of course, they don't have any power in themselves. God is in them and through them. That's how they do what they do, you see. So you have these emanations, ten spheres, that radiate divine energies, you see. <clears throat> and what they do is they create realities, you know, and they create five of them, you see. But what they do is when they do create these realities, they diminish in output. For instance, you have ten spheres, right, and they create five realities. Uh, the first one is called... Odom Kadmoin, primordial man. That's Oilim Habo, by the way. Oilim Habo was the first thing created. Uh, then they create what's called Atsilus. That's the second reality. Uh, third reality is Bria. Then you have Yitzira. And you have Asiya. And then Asiya itself is sub subdivided into a spiritual component 
and also a physical component. We inhabit the Asiya, the physical component, which is the entire universe, 13.7 billion light years, not miles, light years. Uh, and in the light year is approximately <coughs> six trillion miles. So imagine the distance of six trillion miles times 13.7 billion. Imagine the size. I always find what's interesting about that, that means God is larger than all of that. You imagine a being that's larger than the universe? It's incredible, you know? And it's obviously it's not only that, but God is larger than the totality of all existence. Why? Because all existence is within him, and he gives existence to that. So he's got to be larger than all of that. Whatever. Obviously, it's impossible to even think about this. <clears throat> but in any case, so he creates these spheres, and these spheres now uh, emanate whatever they call it. It's called a Shefa, Kedusha, right? And they create these five realities. And the realities get lower and lower. They diminish. Because the, if you want to use an example of a light bulb and the wattage, you know, the spheres start out at 1,000 watts. And the first universe, which is Elim Habo, now has 900 watts, 800, 700, and so on. So you get to this world, which is extremely low wattage. And the physical universe is ridiculous in terms of the divine energy that's invested in this universe. In any case, and all of these things essentially enable God to hide himself. It's really what it is. You see, any dimension outside of God conceals God, you see. Because the real idea of God that we are supposed to believe in is called Enoid Mulvadoi. Besides God, there is nothing else. What do you mean nothing else? Literally. Like Rav Chaim Volozhin says, Mamish. You know, literally. Now we don't understand what that means. What do you mean nothing exists besides God? You had a whole universe out there. No. In the real sense, he's the only thing that has real existence. Everything else is an illusion, you know. Um, in any case. Now, therefore, God creates these realities through the spheres and enables him to conceal himself because each universe can block his visibility. And that's really what he wants. Why? Because the task that he has assigned man, right, is what's called trans retransformation. He wants mankind, specifically the Jewish people later on, to do what? To bring up the energy of the spheres, to redial them. And therefore, every world, starting from the bottom, will retransform into the next higher one, and then the next higher one. So Asiya, which is the lowest, will retransform into Yetzira, actually turns into Yetzira, and Yetzira will turn into Bria, Atzilus. And then in the end of all of this, Odom Kadmon, which is primordial man, which is Hilam Habo. There you have it. And the, what, what's the benefit of all this? Is that God becomes more and more revealed. That's what it is. All of them block him. But if you retransform them into a higher state of existence, guess what? You're much more cognizant of the reality of God. That's what God wants. We transform creation. Who does this? The Jewish people. Each Jew is assigned to a specific area of the spheres, and therefore he can dial up the energy of the spheres. And this is really what Judaism is all about. It's called repair, tikkun. God wants the Jewish people to do tikkun, to repair or to restore reality to its highest level. Very important concept. It's a very simple summary of what Judaism is about. Good, so that's called zikuch. Zikuch means to purify, to remove the blockages of each dimension until you finally get to the ultimate dimension which is a future world where God is revealed in a way which we really cannot even comprehend. That's a very important idea. Now, <clears throat> the Jews do it, but they have to be responsible. 
It's not enough that a Jew does this. He has to have free will. What is free will, really? Free will simply means where you are not compelled to do it. God does not put in your mind to do it. I mean, he tells you, but he does not compel you. Now, the truth is, you wouldn't know if he did that or not. You don't know if you're thinking about that because you want to think about it, or if God is put, putting that into your mind. As far as you're concerned, it's you. No. Free will is called relative. It's a range of free will, you see. But essentially, we have free will, right? And we have to change the universe. That's free will. You know, as God does not put into your mind the idea or the desire. You do. Which also brings up a lot of very interesting concepts and so on, <clears throat> you see. Why? Because God wants you to be a true cause. Because he is a true cause. God is not dependent on anybody. He's not uh, d deprived of anything. He's a being which we call Shalem. He's perfect. But perfection is not in our, you know, perfection to us is relative. You know, if you have a guy who can lift, you know, uh, 300 pounds, wow. Then you have another guy who can lift 1,000 pounds, not too many of those. So we would say, relatively speaking, the guy who can lift 1,000 pounds is perfect compared to the guy who can only lift 300. God's concept of perfection is absolute means there's nothing else that can be added to that meter, to that trait. That's what it means. Now, we have no idea what that means. We don't know how he does it. But uh, like the Ramchal says, boy, he says, we don't know who God is at all. The only one who knows who God is is himself, obviously. He's the only one that has any inkling of who he is, you see. All we know about him, Ramchal says, He's perfect. That means nothing can be added. Nothing in existence can be added to his perfection. Period. That's an absolute statement. In any case, that's what we do know, and so on. Now, therefore, God is the ultimate cause. He decides what he wants to do, and he does it. Nothing is lacking in him. You see, no dependencies no insufficiencies, and so on. So he can do whatever he wants. He's the ultimate true cause of everything. But he wants us to be a cause like him. Now, no matter what we do, obviously we're not a true cause in the sense that we don't cause everything, but God has given the human being, and we don't know how, the ability to truly cause, which means that you actually can make a decision Right? That God does not put into your mind. Now that really is impossible. Because without him putting it to your mind, where did it get its existence from? It doesn't exist. Because he's the only one that could have given existence to that thought. But if you're the one who originated that thought, excuse me, where did, he, where, where did you get the existence for that thought? It wasn't God, or else it wouldn't be free will. We don't know. We have no idea in many ways how free will works, but it does. Why? Because God wants us to truly cause and therefore be responsible for what we do, namely transformation of the cosmos of creation into a higher level. That's really the whole gist of Judaism, you know, and so on. Now, there's a big problem with free will. What's the problem? It's true that if you do it, you will uh, have created a true thing by yourself without God's input. That's true. And therefore, we are God-like, and that's what God wants, that we should be God-like. But there's a big problem. What's the problem? Because imagine if there are a million people on the planet, right? And they all have free will. Free will in terms of what? Of their behavior. You know, will they listen to God or not? So it's possible then for every one of them to do evil, which people do all the time. So imagine if the entire mankind commits evil 24-7. They don't even take a break. You see? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Because man has been granted free will. Oh, so wait a minute, this is not good. 
if God grants man free will, they can ruin the whole situation. They can defy the will of God. It's astounding when you think about that. And God, not that he's okay with it, but he allows that to transpire. They defy the will of God, you see. <clears throat> so that's a real problem. Now you're gonna ask me, well, did that really ever happen? I mean, what are the odds that everybody does evil, right, 24 seven or whatever? Therefore they frustrate God, if you wanna use that expression, right? God's will is frustrated, you see. So the, the question we can ask, did that really ever happen? And the answer is yes. The marble, flood. Everybody was sinning, basically, you know, except Noyach, his sons, their wives, and so on. Everybody was doing evil, right? So what did God decide to do? They're frustrating what I want. Their job is to rectify creation, right? And they have their instrumentation to do that. But they're not doing it. So God decides, I'm going to wipe them out. The experiment or the program it's a failure. So therefore, God exercising judgment or justice can wipe out creation if he doesn't like what's going on, which he didn't, and therefore he wiped out mankind. You have to think about what that means. You know how extreme that is to wipe out every man, woman, child, and every animal, everything. You know, that's why he had Noyach bringing all the animals and so on, you know? That's how extreme their behavior was. But they can only do it because they had free will, you see? So here we have a group of people that actually frustrated God. It's amazing. And the reason for that is because they had free will, you see? Uh, so the concept of a mabel is what did that. So what God decided in the beginning, which is interesting, that he's not gonna tolerate this, you know, that, he is not going to give mankind total free will. Because like I said, they can absolutely, absolutely right, defy the will of God. So therefore, he is going to do something that will guarantee two things. One, that the creation will have a tikkun. Because the only one that can do the tikkun is mankind, obviously. God is not going to bring a tikkun, right, to retransform the creation. By himself, he wants mankind to do it, you see. So what he's gonna do is, he's gonna create a behavior, anhogas, anhoga, which is a behavioral a characteristic, all right, that will guarantee that mankind does the tikkun. It's amazing. But not only that they do the tikkun, he's gonna guarantee, right, that people will be in Oilem Habo. They will get credit. It's very interesting. You see, because if not, then they can all defy the will of God and say, hey, we're doing what we want, forget about it. So he decided that he's not going to allow that to happen. You see, uh, so he created what we now understand as really when you think about it, three hanhogas, three behavioral actions that he does. And basically this is all he does. The first one is called the hanhoga, Right, the behavior of Kiyum. He's going to create the situation in which man can be thrust and he now can do what? He can now do the Tikkun. That's Kiyum. He has he created the entire creation to fulfill his program. So that's the analog of Kiyum where he's going to fulfill his program by setting up. It's like, uh, you know, let's imagine uh, going to a theater so the guy responsible for the whole scene, everything, uh, you know, there's a whole crew there setting up the whole background and so on. So that's the kiyum. They have now created the scenarios where you can have the play, right? In any case, so that's called the anhoga of kiyum, which is precise. Now, precision is very interesting. Precision means that, I don't know if you know it, but there are millions of species Scientists estimate there's 100 million species, not animals or bugs, species, different kinds of living forms. It's astounding. For instance, there are 300,000 
beetles. I don't know if you know that. What? Kinds of beetles. Species, which is a kind of beetle. And they're all different from each other. Now, how many beetles are there? Trillions of beetles. But there's only 300,000 different types of beetles. That's astounding, you see? But that kiln, or that universe that needs this, is so exact that you need all 300,000. If one species was missing, the universe would not exist. Now, we have no idea why. Uh, we have no idea why there are so many beetles. You know, there was one, once an entomologist who said, God must love be beetles. He made, he made so many different kinds. It's incredible, you know. But beetles are one thing, you know. Uh, I think in flowers, there are 26, I think, thousand species of lilies. You know, yeah, you would, you won't, would not believe what's out there. There are, I think, 7,000 species of ants, different forms of ants, right? Some, some people probably saying, and yeah, and they're all living in my backyard, all right? But the, we, we can't believe how many species there are. But what's always interesting is that man has only one species, Homo sapien. There are no others. Man is the only one that violates that rule. And that's one of the proofs that there's no such thing as evolution. Because theoretically, so many other things should have evolved into species of man, which of course never happened, and so on. Anyway, that's the Anagas Hakim. Now what God does, is he has a sign to do the tikkun, right? And what he does is he looks at their behavior. Are they doing what I said they should do or they are not? So therefore he responds to their behavior. That's called mishpat, judgment, justice. That's what he does. He creates the universe, puts man in there, gives him a free will and allows him to do whatever he wants, right? But then he looks at the behavior and he says, okay, how am I going to respond to this? So that's the anhoga called Hanogas Amishpat, the behavior or the action that God does, which is a response to the actions of man, which is always going on, by the way. But in any case, you know, but like I said, since man has the ability to do free will, right, then they can frustrate the will of God. So therefore, God creates a new anhoga. It's called Hanogas Ayichud. That's what it's called. It's this, the actions that God takes, Yichud, which only God can do because justice doesn't rule it immediately. Uh, God does things which are completely contradictory to justice, completely, for the purpose of saving the universe, saving the Jews. It's called Anhogas Yichud, very important concept, you see. <clears throat> And that is the third series of actions that God takes. The problem is that the Anhogas HaYichud, which in many ways we have no understanding of what, how it works and so on, is really in many ways incomprehensible. We don't know how God does this at all. And these, what kind of actions are these? For instance, the exile of the Jews. Why are the Jews exiled for 2,000 years, right? Why are they persecuted so much? Why is there such blatant anti-Semitism, which really many times makes absolutely no sense? You see, why was there a Holocaust? A Holocaust is a classic example of Yichud, of that Anoga. Makes no sense. Why would you want to kill six million of your people when all there is basically is 12 million? You're wiping out half the Jewish people. You see, uh, all of this is Yichud. In fact, I will tell you something. The darkness that we are in now is not mishpat, it's yichud. And we will, I'm going to go into that. The reason why there is such darkness, immorality, depravity, corruption, etc., and evil, uh, is because this is what this hanhoga demands. In order for the Jews to do the tikkun, in order for the Jews to get the credit of the tikkun, there must be darkness before the end. So what we're really looking at is the ultimate hanhogas a yichud. That's really what it is. And the Hanogas HaYichud, as we will see, is in many ways, not only is it unknown, but in many ways it's irrational. It doesn't make sense, you see. Uh, so what God seems to do is at times he conducts himself in a way which is irrational, makes no sense. 
Uh, and not only is it irrational, it's against his stated behavior. Yet, the purpose of this Hanhaga is to save the entire world, right? To guarantee each Jew a place in the future world and to make sure that the world has what is called a tikkun, you see. Oh, this is Anhoga Sayyichud, as we will see. It's a behavior of God that we have no concept of how he does it, but he does do it. So that Anhoga Sayyichud really, that movement by God, is actually the movement that saves the universe, that saves, that makes sure that the universe will have a tikkun, and the Jews who are the assigned people to do it will be in the future world. Thank God for that. And God doesn't wait around asking from our, well, he, in a certain sense, he will, but he does it because that's what he wants to do. In other words, God will not be frustrated. That's what I'm saying. You cannot ultimately frustrate. And we see that many, many times. You see, <clears throat> give you one example, Haman. Haman wanted to destroy the Jews, obviously. Every man, woman, and child, right? But what God wanted, and he used Haman to do it. And Haman, of course, didn't know. He thought he was, you know, trying to get the Jews destroyed. But what God needed Haman for, and he did, is he wanted to scare the Jews to such an extent where they would accept the oral law with love, which they didn't, you see? So he needed somebody to frighten the Jews so they would do tshuva. So what do we see? That Haman was a patsy. That's really what he was. He was used by God for spiritual ends. And that's really everybody. Because in the end, everybody does what God wants. Maybe we know about it, maybe we don't. It doesn't make a difference. And that's why the gematria, the numerical value of Boruch Mordechai, and Oror Homon is exactly the same. Because to God, they're both heroes. Except Mordechai gets reward for his being a hero, right? And Homon is destroyed. But they both are agents of God. Very important concept. There is no such thing as a being that can do whatever it wants. It's interesting. Even though you think that they have independent power, they don't. They must act in accordance with what God wants. Now, <clears throat> we get to Avraham Avinu, which is interesting. Now remember, there was something called Anogas Yichud, right? The attribute of God that guarantees the creation itself. There was. But there was a problem. Because the guarantee only came to mankind. Because mankind cannot destroy itself. And it didn't. By the marble, you had Noyach. So what Noyach did, right, is that Noyach really started off the whole human race, right? So, that, that guarantee, so the guarantee is that man must survive, not any particular man. The Hanhoga, that attribute, didn't direct itself at a specific person or even a specific nation. It just guaranteed that the program, right, will not end. And therefore, it could be anybody. This was in the time of Noyach. And therefore, God said, I'm going to save Noyach. Because the guarantee that mankind must survive through the Tikkun is only on what? It could be on anybody, but it's got to be on somebody. So it was on Noyach. You see, there was no nation or person that the, that Anhogo, right, directed itself against or pointed out. It's an important concept. Now, God looks at Abraham of Romavino. Right? And Avraham Avinu was the only one in his day, we know that, right, doing the will of God. So God decided. Now until Avraham Avinu, which I've said many times, all mankind right, could do the tikkun. Not just Avraham, all mankind. There's no such thing as a Jew. Think about that. There were just 70 nations. And each nation was assigned a particular area in the spheres that they could transform the universe back into the higher worlds. Uh, so therefore, this is what could happen, right? Fine. So God decided, nobody's doing this, so I'm now going to give it to Avraham Avinu and his descendants. 
they will do the tikkun. So therefore the tikkun now became a Jewish enterprise. No longer was it given to mankind, it was given to the Jewish people first through Avraham Avinu. Very important concept. So now the concept of tikkun became a Jewish concept. Now God allowed mankind to try to retrieve the loss by Mount Terra. They didn't want it. So he said, that's gone. I'm now only going to give it to Avram Avinu. And that's it. So some guy wants to become somebody who could do Tikkun, he's got to become Jewish. And it was the nation, nations of the world could no longer become Jewish uh, to do the Tikkun en masse. They could do it as individuals, but not as a nation. Fine. So God appears to Avram Avinu. And what does he say to him? It's okay, you're the guy. You know, I'm going to make a covenant with you. This is the famous Brisbane Absarim, Pashas Lech Lecha, where he makes an agreement with Avram Avinu. And he says to Avram Avinu, okay, you do my will, right? If you do that, you will inherit the land, which means Elim Hapo and so on. So Avram Avinu says, that sounds great, you know? And there are many ideas from that. But Avraham Avinu says, wait a minute, but my Ada, how do I know? You know, you tell me that I and my descendants will do the Tikkun, right? Fine. But what happens if they don't do the Tikkun? What happens if they do exactly what the Mabel did? Because they have Bechira, right? And it's possible that you're telling me you want me to do it, and meanwhile, they're not doing it. So you're going to wipe them out. That's exactly what you did by the Mabel. Why? Because the Anhogas HaYichud, that attribute that guarantees doesn't guarantee a nation will be the one that has to exist. You see, it could be that God will switch to some other nation or destroy and switch it to something else. Because the Anhoga, that action, doesn't guarantee the existence of a specific nation or even an individual. It just guarantees mankind. That's what Avraham Avinu said to him. So the Bonisham said, Okay, you ask me, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the objective of that Anhaga. Interesting. From now on, the Jews are guaranteed to survive. He's changing the objective, you see. So all the Jews are guaranteed to get Oil Mahabo. So the Anhaga goes on the Jewish people as a nation, which is the first time in history that that ever happened, you see. And that's what he did, you see. So that's really what Avraham Avinu accomplished. He got that on Hoga to guarantee that the actions that God takes to guarantee the Tikkun, right, will be on the Jewish nation itself. And that's what God said in Egypt. You know, I'm giving you the Tikkun, uh, what do you call it, uh, responsibility. That's what I'm doing, you see. And how is that? And that's why God said, for them to do the Tikkun, they have to go to Egypt without getting into the whole thing and do the Tikkun by not assimilating into Egypt. But what happens if they do assimilate? Then the Egyptians will now begin to persecute them and treat them as slaves. And that's Yisurin, suffering. And one of the ways that the Anagas HaYichud works, it will subject you to tremendous suffering. So that's where God said they will be there for 400 years, them, and they will serve them, some, and they will persecute them, you see, because the Anagas HaYichud, it now falls on the Jews, right? Uh, but if they don't do the mitzvahs, right, then Anagas HaYichud will guarantee their survival, the Tikkun, by subjecting them to slavery and persecution. And that's the logic. That was the Brisbane Absarum. Well, the Jews were assigned that task, right? Uh, but not only assigned, they were guaranteed that ultimately the Jews can do the Tikkun, which is what happened. They did the Tikkun. The Moshe came to take them out and so on. You see. Now, so that's the first change in this guarantee process. But there's another interesting change, you know, and that was the Akeda. And people look at the Akedah, wow, you know, Yitzchok, as the ultimate test. If, if you ask yourself, what is the real test of the Akedah? 
What did Avraham Avinu think about, right? Because of the Akedah, the commandment to sacrifice Yitzchak on the altar. Well, there are, if you think about it, there were many things that he was subjected to. The first thing he was subjected to is, wait a minute, how can I kill Yitzchak? He's my son. So that's the first incredible son uh, uh, test. Imagine where God appears to you and says you need to kill your son? Would, would, we, would we be able to do that? So that's the first test, right? <clears throat> the second test is not only he's a son, right? But this is murder. Okay, when we kill Yitzchak, he didn't do anything to deserve death. God doesn't murder people unless they, justice demands that they be killed. But Yitzchak didn't do anything that would deserve his death. So the second thing is, excuse me, God doesn't do this kind of stuff. He doesn't murder people without any justification. So Avraham Avinu is thinking about this, and that's what he says. The third test is, wait a minute, God is an infinite Baal Chesed. He's tremendous in mercy and in kindness. Kind people don't do this to other people. It's the exact opposite of kindness. How can God say this? It's completely contrary to his nature. Fourth test, not only is he kind, Avraham Avinu is kind. God is asking Avraham Avinu to murder, kill somebody who's not justified, right? But Avraham Avinu is the what? Is the hallmark of chesed, kindness. So this is against his nature. Can you imagine what it is for a person to do something against their nature, you see? And not only that, he's the last Jew. After Yitzchak, there's no Jewish people left, right? That was the only real son that he had that's Jewish, right? Because Yitzchak was from Rivka, right? Uh, Sarah, I should say, and Avram. So if he kills Yitzchak, that's the last Jew. Now what do you do? So all of this is incredible. It's completely irrational. You think about this. This is what God is asking me to do. But you know what the, the worst test of all was? Because the Rebbe Hashem says a prophecy. Ki Yitzchak ikor In Yitzchak will be called your seed. Means the descendants from you will be through Yitzchak. But wait a minute. You're asking me to kill Yitzchak. Dead people, right, don't give birth to other people, right? So how in the world can Yitzchak, how can the Jewish people go through Yitzchak? It's impossible. You see, what's really impossible? Your prophecy. You gave a, prof a prophetic statement, which is an absolute truth, that the Jewish people would descend from Yitzchak. But if I kill him, that's impossible. So you are contradicting yourself. You are behaving in an ir irrational way manner. That's what he is. So the question is, what is God doing? God is presenting himself as an irrational God. I mean, what would you think about if you were subjected to this and you were thinking about it? It's impossible, you know? That means God is what's called capricious. Now he wakes up one morning and decides this is what he's got to do. What kind of God is that? Could you imagine that God was presenting himself to Avraham Avinu as completely irrational and contradictory, you see. Now why would God want to do that, you see? Why would he want to do that? That's an incredible way to present yourself. It's an incredible kind of test, you see. Now, there are things that God does which is unknown. We don't know why he does that, but they're not irrational. This was irrational to say that the Jewish people will descend from Yitzchok, right? And then to say, kill the last Jew, is completely insane, it's irrational. And that's the problem. Why was God presenting himself in an irrational way? This is the concept. That was the real test of Rome. Because Avram Avinu was a phenomenal thinker, philosopher, and irrationality is the worst thing a philosopher can deal with because it doesn't make sense. It's completely logical. That is the question. You see, why would God present himself in an irrational way? And the answer to that 
is an incredibly important idea what God wanted to accomplish. There is a Rashi on the Akedah that says the following. Why did God do this? So it says that at times, many times, the Sultan appears in front of God. You see, the famous prosecutor. And he says to God, he says, I don't understand this. They're sinning all the time. Why do you love them so much? What are you trying to save them for? Because that's what it is. Why are you practicing Hanogas HaYichon on the Jews? Will you guarantee that they will exist? Why? They are incredible sinners. You represent justice. So I don't stand. That, so it says that the Satan and the Umus HaOilam, the nations of the world, it's Mamash over there in the Akedah, they will present themselves and say, we have a major complaint against you. You know, why do you love them so much when they don't deserve to be guaranteed? <clears throat> Interesting. So what the Bershom does is he created an event that answers the question. Because remember, God does not just want to dismiss the Sultan. He created him to represent justice. But he has to answer the claim. How can you do that when there are so many times violating? So here's what he said. And now you understand why he did the Akeda. He did the Akeda. He actually rep he presented himself to Avram Avino as what? As irrational. So here's what God, he turns to the Sultan and says, wait a minute, look, look at this. I mean, I'm, I'm presenting myself as an irrational God, right? Yet the guy doesn't want to stop. He insists on killing Yitzchak, and we know the Malach tried to stop him from killing Yitzchak, and Avram Avino fought him. So God said, wait a minute, look at this. You know, I'm giving him every reason not to cease. You know, or, or, or to cease, I should say, because it's irrational. Yet Avram Avinu is in love with me to such an extent that he's going to kill Yitzchak. So God looks at the Sultan and says, right, this is justice, right? They love me so much, Avram Avinu, right? How can I abandon them? If I have a person that is so in love with me that he will do even to defy logic, makes no sense. And he will not stop. Why? Because he loves me. They won't abandon me. How can I abandon them? What an answer. In other words, the reason why he needed the Akeda, and that's what Rashi really says, he needed the Akeda that no matter what the Jews do, when they exhibit royalty and devotion, then God says they deserve the Anhogas HaYichud, even though they're sinning terribly. It's an incredible concept that God needed to justify the Anhogas HaYichod for the Jewish people. So he therefore said, if they ever ask me to do the Anhogas HaYichod, then I have to do it. Because they love me so much, right? They will do whatever, right? And therefore, if they will not abandon me, how can I abandon them? Justice demands that I do not abandon them. And that means guarantee. That's why the Akedah happened. The Akedah happened so we can say to God, save us, because you promised Avram Avino, all right, that we will be saved, right? And therefore Yitzchak was saved, even though he was slated to die. That was a demonstration of Anagas Yichud, that the Jews will not be slaughtered, you see. So this is the concept of the Akedah, very important concept. And Rashi is the key to that concept. Other than that, we wouldn't know why God this. I mean, why would anybody do this, you know? And like I said, the worst possible case, right, is where uh, the Rabbi Shem appeared in such an irrational way. Why would he do that? Because the Rabbi Shem needed somebody to demonstrate the absolute love. And therefore, God can say, if they ever ask for me to save them because of the guarantee, even they don't deserve it, I must do it. Why? Because justice demands the Anhogas HaYichud. Not because I want to do it. Justice demands. So the Akedah is a profound concept. With the Akedah, and that's why we say it so often, 
you see, because that enables us to guarantee that on the Jewish people, no matter what they do, because of the schus of Avraham Avinu. And that begins to tell us an incredible amount of secrets of what is going on, you see. And that's why, by the way, <clears throat> you see, you know, this is the greatest, uh, in, in Yiddish is Duchfal, the greatest catastrophe to the Sutton. Because no matter what he does, he's saying, wait a minute, what do you mean? Uh, the, I and the nations of the world are saying, what do you love them so much? Switch them to somebody else. That's what the Sutton is saying. Of course, why do you think he's saying that? Because he knows he can get the nations of the world to sin much better than the Jewish people. This is the problem the Sultan has with the Jews. The Jews are what? I'm sure if they're stiff-necked. You know, once they believe in something, it's not going to give it up. Whereas Goyim, you know, what else, you know? Uh, a couple of bucks, and we're different people, right? That's why the Sultan wants other nations to do the Tikkun. You see? Not the Jews. Because the Jews are stubborn. Once they believe in God, they're not going anywhere, and so on, you see? Uh, but it allows the Sultan and the nations of the world to fail in their complaint against the Jewish people, and therefore they should not be Hanugis Yichud, you see? And that's exactly what the Akeda is, with the Jews, and that's really the whole form of the Akeda. The Jews are supposed to die. That's why, he, why was this, it's a, it's a funny way of testing Avram. Well, he takes Yitzchak and puts him on the altar to kill him. Because what God is saying, someday the Jews are going to be high of Misa. The sinning will be so terrible that really they should all die. Which I once talked about, the Yisur and Mashiach and Yosef and so on, right? But you know what saves them? So go and take the isle. There's an isle which is captured with his horns. So Avraham Avinu sees that and takes it and puts it on Tachas Benoi instead of his son. What do you mean? It should just said he took the isle, the ram, and he sacrificed it. What does it mean instead of? Because really Yitzchak should have died. That's the sin of whatever the Jews did. And this happens at the end of days. And that's why this is the last test, you see. So really the Jews should perish. But the reason why they don't is because of Avram Avinu, his ex exhibition of royalty was staggering, you see, and therefore he is saved. And this is really what the Akedah is. That is why, you know, we glean the reward from Avram Avinu. I mean, this happened 4,000 years ago. I mean, how much can you milk this event? Right? Think about that. It's 4,000 years ago. Okay, you want to give him, you know, merit and all that? Great. Come on, 4,000 years ago, you're still giving them merit because of their Akedah? And the answer is, it's, it's not the merit of their Akedah. It's what the Akedah really was. That because the Jews have such loyalty and devotion, they have a right to ask for the Anhogas HaYichot. And that is the ultimate guarantee that they will survive and that they will do the Tikkun. You see, very, very important. In other words, Yichot, is justified because of what Avraham Avinu did. Very important idea. That's why the Akedah is mentioned 4,000 years later. It's still mentioned because we derive that incredible uh, ability because of Avraham Avinu. Now, what happens next? Okay, the Jews are in Egypt. They go and they sin at the Golden Calf. Uh-oh. God says, this is no good, right? Stand aside, and I will wipe them out. Remember that? Vachala. Stand, this is by the Chet uh, right? God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, they did the golden calf, which was a terrible sin, and I achala or some, I want to wipe them out, right? But you can ask, what do you mean wipe them out? You promised that the Anogas HaYichud goes on them as a nation. So you can't wipe them out. You're violating your own promise. Right? So how did God cover himself? Because he promised. Because he said, I will make you the nation of Israel. Right? That's what God said. Why? Because he couldn't get away from it. He promised that Jewish people will do the tikkun and be guaranteed oilam habo. Right? Okay. So he's not guaranteeing the Jews in the, 12, four, the form of the 12 tribes. 
He'll make Moshe Rabbeinu the 12 tribes. It's not a problem for God. That's why he said to Moshe Rabbeinu, and I will make you a great nation. Because he had to. Because Anoga Seyichud was on the Jewish people. So what was he going to do? Ignore that? Couldn't. That's why he had to say to Moshe, I will make you the great nation. And Moshe Rabbeinu realized this. You can't believe what Moshe had to know to lead the Jewish people. He had to know all this hashkafa. You see, so Moshe Rabbeinu did the thing which is remarkable. He said, no way, right? Erase me from your sefer. Well, what happens if you do that? Moshe Rabbeinu said, I refuse. You're not going to make me the Jewish people, which God could do. Then Moshe would have 12 tribes. You see? So Moshe Rabbeinu says, forget about it. I'm out of here. Right? Take me out. So God is stuck. He has to keep the Jews because there's no substitute. That's why God said, Solachti, I have forgiven Kidvorecha, like your words, because you said, no, erase me from your safer. So in a certain sense, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, what he called, made it impossible for God, right, to abandon the Jews. I can imagine what Moshe Rabbeinu has to know. What a lawyer, right? And he, uh, who are we talk about? He's arguing with God. We're not looking at some local hack, right? <clears throat> We're looking at the greatest mind, so to speak, in existence. And he's got to argue with God. But Moshe Rabbeinu has the, the advantage of knowledge. He knows of the Anogus HaYichod. He knows God must adhere to that. Because that was his promise to Avraham Avinu. So he said, no way. So God said, Solachti, I have forgiven the, the Jewish people. Kidvorecho, based on your words that you will not be the substitute. I have no choice. I cannot destroy them. You see? Ah, but Moshe Rabbeinu, smart. He knew, wait a minute, you know, maybe God won't destroy them, right? But maybe he will take away the tikkun ability of the Jews. Okay, I won't kill them, right? They will be guaranteed to survive, right? But they can't do tikkun, right? So Moshe Rabbeinu went up the second time, 40 days, to pray to God that he maintain his relationship with the Jews. They do the tikkun. You see, that's what he did. Amazing. But then Moshe Rabbeinu thought about it and says, wait a minute, maybe God will hedge his bets, which means he will allow another nation also to do the tikkun. It's like, you know, but you, put, you don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? So the Jews will do the tikkun, and he's now going to put another nation side by side with the Jewish people. So Moshe Rabbeinu went up a third time where God, he, he had God promise that he will never replace the Jewish people. They're the only ones that can do the tikkun. What a lawyer. You know, I wonder what his fee was to do that. Imagine to argue if three times he had to anticipate what God was going to do, do, do you see? And then we finally come to the Miraglam, you know, which is later. And of course, they sin terribly, you see? But what was their sin, really? There's a lot of talk about that. But what did they do? Because the Moraglim said something which is hard to understand. They said, Ki menu, that the Canaanites are greater than God. They're stronger than God. You see, so in many ways, they denied the ability to, of God to overcome the seven nations of Canaan. Uh, so God appears to Moshe Rabbeinu and says, wait a minute. You see, forget about it. Why? Because, what do you mean they're stronger than me? You're denying that I even have the ability to guarantee them. So that's measure for measure. They don't even believe that I can guarantee them because of the Anongas Yichud. So there is no Anongas Yichud for these people. They don't even believe in it. Because they believe the Canaanites are stronger than my statement that I'm going to give the land of Canaan to the Jews. So why should they be candidates for this Anoga? That's what God said. You see, so Moshe Rabbeinu said, Yigdal no koyach Hashem, let the strength of God be greater, that even if they deny your ability to be able to do this, do it anyway. And in that way you will show that you are above justice. Because justice says, hey, you don't believe I can do this, I'm not doing it for you. You see? So therefore Moshe Rabbeinu requested, let the koyach of God be grow mightily, which means that show that you can violate justice and still save them even though they don't really deserve it. 
I mean, we see what Moshe Rabbeinu really was, which is astounding. What he had to know, and how to deal with the Sultan, and how to deal with God's taina to save the Jews. And when you think about that, I mean, it's just absolutely incredible, you see. So we see that this Hanhogo, this guarantee to say that the Jews will survive, has a history, you see. It had to go through a whole series of events in order for ultimately to know that we are guaranteed that there will be a tikkun, right? And that the Jews will be the ones who bring the tikkun. And it's all because ultimately the of us and so on. You see, in any case, and really when you think about it, there's a story of Rabbi Akiva. He was in, Rabbi Akiva died in, in uh, Caesarea, on Yom Kippur. And the Romans were scraping his back. They were killing him. But terrible torture, you know. And Rabbi Akiva was dying, obviously. And he said, Shema Yisrael. So the Malachim, famous Gemara, Malachim said, Zu Torah, Zu Schorah? We don't understand. Rabbi Akiva is the one who's responsible for the transmission of the oral law. Without Rabbi Akiva, we'd be lost. So the Malachim are saying to God, wait a minute, this makes no sense. This is irrational. This is his reward for what he does? It's impossible, you see. So God said to the Malachim, you know, This is a decree before me. So then the Malachim continue, and he says to them, If you continue saying and claiming, how could I do this? I'm going to wipe out the universe. I restore the universe to tell you about you. So we ask ourselves, what kind of answer is that? Like God flexed his biceps, his muscles, and said, you guys don't stop it, I'm going to wipe you guys all out. Well, that's a threat. That's not a just argument. That's not a legal argument. <laughs> you know, it's called might makes right. Uh, you know, so what kind of answer is that? But here's what God really said. They said to God, how can somebody do this and suffer the death of such incredible cruelty? What kind of justice is that? So God said, shh, don't question me. But they continued. So he said, I'm going to wipe out the universe if you continue. I'll restore the universe to tell you about you. What was that? So God said this. <clears throat> His death is part of the Anhogas HaYichud. It's to make sure the Jews survive. And I cannot tell you the reason, because if you know the reason, then the Sultan is going to know the reason. And he's going to argue on the contrary. Because he doesn't want the Jews to survive, you see. So this, what you're looking at, is the Anhogas HaYichud, right? Uh, this is the mystical, right, concealed behavior that I do to guarantee the survival of the Jewish people, right? And if I tell you, then the Sutton will know and try to prevent it. And if the Sutton knows, what happens? That's the end of it. He will know the judgment, he will know what's happening, and he'll argue against that, and that's the end of the universe. The universe can't survive, because it won't survive just on justice. That's what God was saying. Not because I'm going to wipe you guys out, you keep complaining. Because what I'm doing now is part of the Anogas HaYichud. And I cannot tell you the secret of how it works. Because if I tell you, which means the angels, that means everybody will know, including the Sultan. And he will do his best to try to, you know, prevent the Anogas HaYichud from coming. That's what he really said. And you know what's interesting? When Rabbi Akiva was dying, what did he say? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lokeinu, Hashem Echod. So they asked him, how could you say this when you're dying? I mean, this is, I'm, I'm sure Rabbi Akiva said to himself, I don't understand what's going on here. How could I be going through this? It's contrary to everything Judaism stands for, you see. But what did Rabbi Akiva do? He said, Shema Yisrael, hero is the Lord God, the Lord is one. That means, no, even though this is irrational, I will do what Avraham Avinu did. I will declare absolute loyalty to God. You see, there you are. Even though God is appearing irrational, and even the Malachim are saying, Zut Torah versus Chora, right? This is the Torah and this is the reward. It's irrational. But I will say Shema Yisrael, which means I will declare my loyalty and devotion to God. Therefore, right, 
he recognized that this is the Anagas HaYichud. This is what, this is the mystical actions that God has to do for the Jewish people to survive. And in the end of time, we will know why he had to die. And so on, this way, and so on. In any case, that's what you see. That's the idea of Rabbi Akiva. Very important idea. We understand also many things. What does it say in Shema Yisrael? Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it says, If you are half to Hashem Lokecho, and you will love the Lord your God. Can you imagine God is saying, You have to be in love with me? With all your heart, with all your soul, and all your possessions. What is this? I mean, God is not just saying, observe my commandments. He says, no, you need to love me. What's the extent of that liebschaft, that love? All your heart, all your life, and all your possessions. Why? Because that's how we can activate an Hagasayichot. When a Jew is unbelievably loyal and devoted to God, even though the test that he is subjected to is a test which is irrational. That activates the Anagas HaYichud. Because the Nesotim cannot taina, like God says. If they will not abandon me, right, then how can I abandon them? That's why Judaism is filled with the concept of loving God, right? With all your soul, even though it's irrational, that makes sense what's going on here. Because the Bosham needs the Jewish people to be loyal, to be devoted to him, and therefore, he can stand up in front of the court, the Sutton, and say, I'll tell you why I do not abandon them, because they will not abandon me. That's why Judaism requires love, right? It doesn't be, it's not just requiring, you know, uh, submission. Well, you got to listen to me. That it does anyway. But there's such an emphasis, li'avos Hashem lo'kecho, to love God. Why? Because love means devotion. Love means that I will do no matter how you appear, you see. And God needs that to justify that that series of actions he takes to guarantee the Jews. It enables God to stand up in front of the Bezdin, in front of the Sutton, and say, I'm sorry, you lose. Because I cannot abandon them through justice. So you can go home. You see, that's the reason why. Because you, you, you ever wonder, what got into this love business? He's a king, and a king requires submission. Fine, okay. But what's this love business, right? I gotta love you, right? With all your, my soul, I mean, that's complete soul. That's all of you. Complete possessions, right? And complete heart, right? But there's not even room for anybody else. The love of a Jew has to be so total to God that there's not even room for his wife and his kids. Imagine what that's what I mean, with all your heart. Why? Because God wants the Tikkun to be complete. He wants the Jews to be in Oyelam Haba, right? And he needs to be able to justify it in front of the Bezdin with the Sutton screaming his head off, you see. And I'll tell you something, which is very important. Rosh Hashanah, guess what? We're about to enter Rosh Hashanah. Right? We're very close. Right? What is it happens on Rosh Hashanah? Judgment. Right? It's a judgment. Right? So all of us are, you know, asking God, please overlook our sins, and whatever, forgive us, and so on. But the amazing thing is what? So it's like a court case. So first, God says, you know, do tshuva. Repent. And I will forgive you. And you can keep on existing. Right? But here's the problem. The problem is satanic. Because there's a sutton up there saying, wait a minute, what kind of tshuva is that? It's only going to last for 10 days, and then you guys are going to go back to do what you did before. It's the, whole, the whole thing is a mockery, you see? So what do we do to protect ourselves from the kitrugam of the sutton? And what do we do? We blow shofar. Right? Why? Because shofar stops the sutton. That's why. In fact, the psukim that you read, the Korah Sotan, actually the letters spell out Korah Sotan, we destroy the Sotan. How? Because when we blow shofar, 
Why do we have a shofar? Akedas Yitzchak. What we're saying is, God, save us. Even if it means, right, that you have to activate the Anoga Seyicha to save us, which means you have to go into your mysterious courtroom and do whatever you do. So the shofar activates the Anoga Seyicha because it represents the Akedah. We know that. That's why we read the Akedah on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Because that's central to our defense. In other words, if we don't make it, we don't do enough tshuva and so on, and therefore the sultan is and say, what do you mean? They're not doing tshuva. So why do they deserve to live? So therefore God gave a mitzvah of shofar, the Akedah. And the Akedah enables us to activate the Anogas HaYichud, right? And we say to God, do with us that will save us, even if it means suffering. And that's why the sounds of a shofar we represent crying. That's really what the sounds of the shofar represent. Why? Because even if you make us suffer and we cry, that's the Anogas HaYichud. Save us. You see? So that's the actual thing that we use at the defense. The Anogas HaYichud. And it's because of Avraham Avinu. You see? And that enables us really to survive. That's really, in many ways, you should know, we are looking at a world that has tremendous amount of corruption, evil, depravity, immorality. I mean, you name it, it's insane. What is this? This is Anogas HaYichud. This doesn't make sense. Why would God allow all this to happen? You know, free will is one thing. But this is a complete takeover of the morals of mankind. Because we are now in the end. And in the end, the major anhoga, the major series of actions that exist, is yichud. Because God wants to make sure that no matter all the sins of the Jews, He wants the Jewish people to be guaranteed to exist in the future world. That's really all this is about, you see. And we have to believe that. That's really what we're looking. And we know that the anhoga say yichud is irrational. That's how, that's how God hides it. There's no logic in it. Only he knows the logic. Of course there's a logic, but it's unknown, you see. And therefore what it means is that that will save us. So as we get closer to the end, you see, the major series of actions that God does is Yichud, right? Because he's got to save the world, he's got to save the Jewish people and get them into Olam Habo. So you now understand, you see, that the Akeda justifies our asking him, save us. And that's exactly what we do in Rosh Hashanah, which is so interesting, you know. Now you understand the logic of Shaifa, because if we don't do enough tshuva, so all of a sudden the Sutton is saying, hey, they're not doing tshuva, come on. So God says, wait, they blew the Shaifa. Therefore, I have to go into my private chambers and I will save them. Because that's what Avram Abdi-Vino did 4,000 years ago which really, when you think about it, it's really astounding and so on. So therefore, today, as I said, you see, we are um, in the midst of an Hogus HaYichud. That's the real explanation for the Holocaust, for the unbelievable anti-Semitism, you see, why Jews have suffered for thousands of years. You see, that's the logic. It's the same idea with Rabbi Akiva. That's why the Malachim were astounded. I mean, we're talking about the Malachim. And if anybody has a clear-eyed vision of what God is doing, they certainly have a lot better than we do. Yet they had no idea this makes no sense. Because the death of Rabbi Akiva was so horrendous. Even that didn't make sense. And that's why God said, you are watching an incredible intensification of this Hanhogo. And that Hanhogo is necessary to get all the Jews to survive and be in Olim Habo. We will know that someday. And by the way, that's why it says in Ashrei, right? It says there, you know, uh, <coughs> Sadiq Hashem Bechol Rochov, that God is a Tzadik in all his way. Tzadik means righteous. That's the Anhogas HaMishpat. God is just. The Chosid Bechol Mahasav. And a Chosid is somebody who does more than the judge, the justice. You see? So God is a Tzaddik that every one of us will get Oilam Habo to what we caused, 
right? But the chosid the chomas of, right? He's a chosid. He goes beyond the din, and that's Hanoris Hayichod, so that we will all survive and get Oilam Habo. See, God is described as two different characteristics Tzadik and a Chosid. Right? And a Chosid doesn't mean Chasidisha. Because then you'd ask who's the Rebbe. But anyway, um, that's why Dovid Amelach describes God in two ways, you see. So we have to be lucky. We have to be so thankful that the Baruch Hashem decided that he's not going to allow mankind to frustrate him. And not only that, because of Avram Avinu. Imagine what they had to know to talk to God. Well, Avram said, wait a minute. You wiped out the marble, you wiped out them, so maybe they'll wipe out the Jews if they don't do the tikkun. So God changed the Anoga from mankind to the individual nation called Jews. And Moshe Rabbeinu came along and he changed the Anoga from the Jews in the form of 12 tribes, or rather in the form of an individual, right? Only in the form of 12 tribes. So by Moshe rejecting the whole thing, God had sort of like no choice, but he had to keep the Jewish people guaranteed in the form of the 12 tribes of Yaakov, not in the form of 12 tribes that would have descended from Moshe Rabbeinu. You see, so because we have all these Sadiqim who know exactly how to talk to God, imagine what we have to have to make it, and so on, then these people are successful in arranging uh, these ideas. And now you understand that the whole concept of the Akedah is a setup. It's what it was, because the Bosham needed this event to stand in front of the Sultan and say, I'm sorry, justice demands that they be subject to the Anogas Yichud, the guarantee. Why? Because if they don't abandon me, how could I abandon them? It's an astounding concept that this event that took place 4,000 years ago is so that we can survive today. That demonstrates to us the incredible love that God has for us. That's what it means. Because God is not going to ask you to do something that He does not do. So if He says to you, and you love the God, your God, with all your might, all your heart, and all your life, I guarantee you, He's got the same thing in reverse. It has to be the same thing. He's not going to ask something, right, for us that He Himself doesn't do. You see. So that's what tells you that God loves us. We don't understand what that means, you know, or how and so on. But he, he does love us, the whole of Avchem, with all his heart, whatever that is, with all his soul, whatever that is, right? And with all his possessions, which means the totality of the entire universe, all the worlds, all the five worlds, right? Is all because of the Jewish people. And he, it's like a father with a son, or a mother with a son, whatever, that they will do anything for their kids to survive, to flourish at a future time. So that's a tremendous nechoma for Tisha B'Av, which is about to come, right? That in the end, all of this, if it doesn't make sense to you, it's because of the Anogas HaYichud. It's there to save the Jewish people. Just like Rabbi Akiva needed to die that way, and, and there's a whole reason for that, in order for the Jewish people to survive. And that's really what you have to think about. And that is, I feel, the greatest nechama, the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, is the Anogas Hayichud. It allowed, I mean, uh, come on, these bunch of these Roman guys come in and wipe out the Beis Hamikdash. Excuse me, like how in the world does that happen? I mean, what a goyim, goyim, the goyim are nothing. So how does God allow that? You know, a place where in the Kodesh Kedoshim, angels could not fly through that room. You believe this? Only the Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippur, a Malach could not go through that room. That's how great the sanctity was. So how does God allow, right, whether it be Titus or any of these guys, to destroy his base of English, right? And he does that because that is what's required in order to save the Jews. And someday, when the Mashiach arrives, we're going to sit down with this guy, with this man, Sadik, and we're going to say, okay, we would like to ask you many questions. You know, and you can go from your private life. Why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? Or, you know, and, and, and so on. He's going to have to answer everything. You see? 
And then ultimately, we're not going to ask him on a personal level. We're going to ask him a national level. Why, why, what's this exile for 2,000 years? That's such a long time. We're talking about anti-Semitism, the exile, the persecution of the Jews. Jews were burned at the stake, you know, in the time of the Inquisition. What the Nazis did is beyond humanity. That's what it is, and so on. And the, the Mashiach uh, is going to sit down with us and answer every question that we have. And we will be shocked to realize so much of this happened because God needed to do this to save the Jews. And ultimately speaking, we will know why. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Yes? Uh, uh. Wait, she, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so you're Right. By hook or by crook? And, and what about non-Jews? What about who? Non-Jews. Non-Jews will also get Olam Haba. All of them? No. It depends on what they do. The guarantee does not exist by non-Jews. Only by Jews. But they still get Olam Haba. If a Gentile, a guy, is righteous, right? A righteous means a Noachide, basically, where they observe the seven commandments of Noah, right? But it means any guy that's a decent person. And there are many goyim that are decent people. They will get Olam Haba. But their Olam Haba is not direct. They get it through the Jew. Because the, the spheres give their energy into your neshama. And your neshama is what brings it out to the world. And the goyim can take from that, but they have to hang around you. That's why it says, ten goyim are going to hang around every Jew. So it sounds like you're not on the same level. No way. Of course not. And what happens to those that don't get? That don't get what? Every person will be rewarded and punished based on his deeds. Everybody. You see? And uh, they will be annihilated. There is no such thing as another place. It's either oilam habo or bust. That's what it is. Why do you think there's a stock market, just as an aside? Why is there a stock market? Stock market is not a business. It's where you take a share in somebody else's business, right? He's got to work the whole thing. You got to share because he needs your money, right? And you get part of the profit. Why? Because God has to reward everybody what they did. There's no time, right? There's no time to reward people. It takes years to build a business. So God put in the mind of man, right? To have this type of a business where you can get profit from other people, right? And you can become a multimillionaire in one year. See, it's called a quickie. And there are people who have to be punished, right? So God will get them to invest in something and it's going to flop. And bam, oh, they're poor. The stock market is an unbelievable device that rewards and punishes instantly or over a month or two. Yes, all of this has a cheshben. You see, it's not because somebody woke up one day and said, ooh, wah, I got a fabulous idea to make money. No, that idea was put into his mind in order to reward and punish people at the end of time. You see? Yes? The spheres. The who? The spheres, the other, like, uh, yeah. like uh, there was Yitzira, Tzilut, and, and... Those are the world, right. The world. Where do they come into play? Those are the different levels of existence. Each one has its own place. We live in the world of Asiya, which is also, Asiya also has a spiritual domain, seven heavens and all that. Yitzira is the residence of Malachim. Angels live in Yitzira. Okay? And the Bria, you have certain forces that give rise to the material world. And there are also angels there. Atsilus, there are no beings in Atsilus. That is the place of the Shekhinah. That's really what it is. And Adam Kadmon doesn't exist yet. We have to make it, transform it. So each one has its own residence, you see? But ultimately, we have to transfer 
or we have to transform, I should say, every world into an upper world, upper world, upper world. We actually reverse the process of the beginning of time. And the last uh, uh, reversal is what's called Olim Habo, and that goes on forever. There's no more reversal. I explained this in previous show. See? Yeah. So why do like anti-Semitic Jews have a place in the world? Um, why do who? Anti-Semitic Jews. Why would an anti-Semitic Jew have a place in the world come, especially if they have no intention of doing sure? The answer to that is because of free will. Everybody has a right to do whatever he wants. God is not going to compel anybody. You know, he put out all the warning signs, the Torah and so on. And if a person wants to be evil, he can do it. This is a world where you can choose evil. So why do you get reward for that? What? Why do you get reward for that? For what? You're saying that all Jews would have a place in the world to come. So I'm asking you, why would an anti-Semitic Jew... Oh, get a reward? Because he's going to have to expiate. He's not going to just walk into Eilam Habo. He's going to have to go through a lot of bad stuff in order to get into Eilam Habo. Primarily, Yisurin. Suffering is the way he will get his Eilam Habo, which is nothing compared to somebody who does the mitzvahs. You know? But ultimately speaking, God can uh, repair anybody, really. So you're saying like in the 11 months after death, that's when they would be punished? And then During 11 months, Gehenna, yeah, right. And Gehenna has many levels of intensity and so on. It's all cheshbon, you know. But what God can also do is bring him back, Gilgal, right? Bring him back. And right now, once Mashiach comes, right? Once Mashiach comes, it's over with. Right. But, you know, right now, people are born every day with major handicaps, etc. I mean, once Mashiach comes. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, then, then it's over. There's no more free will because Mashiach is here, there's many reasons, um, and so on. And, uh, but God can make anybody, He can repair anybody if He wants to. And the Jews have that guarantee. You know, I always get a kick out of the fact there's a Chazal that says that Esau of Russia is going to be in Gan Eden. You believe this? Esau is going to be in Gan Eden, right? And not only that, but Esau is going to sneak his way, makes sense, Right? To try to get a front seat. And God all of a sudden is going to, a Basco comes out and says, Excuse me, Asaph, you don't deserve to be here. Get back to the lower rung. But the. Well, that's, that's what it shows you. Now, uh, so the question is, what in the world is he doing in Gan Eden? I mean, it's about Asaph or Russia. And the answer is because he did Shuva, and like I gave a whole share in that, right? So you see that God can repair anybody, you know? Although there is a threshold. If you do not make the threshold, then you're ben oilim hazeh. God will send you back to collect any reward, right? And then you will suffer in Gehenna and then be annihilated. Nobody walks out free. You gotta undo your sins. You see, so that, that will happen, so on. That's why it says, call Yisrael, Every Jew has a chilek in Olim Habo, and that always will remain. The question is, what's your chilek? Is it a palace or a hut? That's the question. But in the end, you're there. But uh, at least you're there. Now that mission does say chutz me, and there's some um, exceptions. The principles, or, or that's ah, like those seven people? Or whatever. But the, other principles. But the truth is, they will also get Olim Habo. Because what that mission is really saying is that these people, al pidin, do not deserve Oilam Habo. But like I said, God can substitute dinam for other Yisurin and they will get. So they don't get Oilam Habo based on the law. But if God intervenes and gives them what's called equivalencies, they will get Oilam Habo. So the truth is everybody will get Oilam Habo. Everybody. Every Jew will be in Oilam Habo. Question, of course, is at what level? Tremendous question, so on, you know? Yeah? You mentioned the, the 12 tribes. What about our 10 lost tribes? What, how, the 10 lost tribes is a very interesting topic. Very fascinating topic. 
But in many ways, you know, they have, you know, you, you have, your question really is why they lost. Not why they lost historically, because Sancher of whatever. The question is what's the Avoida? How do they contribute to the Tikkun? That's the real problem with the Ten Tribes. But apparently there is a way to contribute to the Tikkun, even if you are lost, you know, and that will be explained. And they will return. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, like Rabbi Akiva said, Asidin, the, uh, in the future, the Ten Lost Tribe will uh, come back, you know. But besides the Ten Lost Tribes, I know most people are not aware, there's also the Bnei Moshe. People are doing, uh, there's another bunch of lost tribes, but they're not lost. They, there's a, because Moshe Rabbeinu, which is very interesting, it's in Orchaim, in the Chumash, where it says that uh, there's a, uh, uh, when God said to Moshe, "We ask the Godel," and He said that I will make you for a great nation. And the problem is, God never retracts what He says, even if you don't deserve it, because that's the truth of God. So what He did is the Bnei Moshe, the, which was supposed to be the great tribe, they exist, and they are somewhere in West China. There's a, there's people looking for them, right? The Bnei Moshe, and they're supposed to be very tall, all tzaddikim. In fact, they're, they're, there's a place in western China, I think next to Kazakhstan. There are people actually try to want to go there, but Ch China doesn't allow it. The, the, it's called the Bnei Moshe. They're supposed to be very tall, and there have been reports of very tall people, apparently with tzitzis, whatever, coming down from somewhere in the mountains. And Western China is all mountainous. It's like Shangri-La, you know, and have bought stuff in a city which is in Western China called Musa, Moses. It's actually a city called Musa in Western China. It's right at the border of Kazakhstan, and that's a tremendously mountainous region. You know, the Orachim talks about this, where it says, that the, and they will come before the Mashiach. So you can actually see people, and they stay by themselves. Amazing things how they can hide out without civilization recognizing. But there is, there are places on earth where people, we don't know where everybody is, you know. But anyway, so you have the Bnei Moshe, and you have the Ten Lost Tribes. But the Ten Lost Tribes, you know, the people have an idea where they are. You know, the, uh, what do you call it, the... Uh, Taliban, Pashtun. The Pashtun have many mitzvahs that, that are Bamash like mitzvahs, and like, where did they get it from? You know? In fact, they themselves say that they are children of Israel, and they were all converted like 500 years ago. The Pashtun, uh, the Taliban in uh, Afghanistan, yeah, they are certainly part of the Ten Lost Tribes. You know? How they will come back when we're unknown. Everything is going to be supernatural, everything. Yeah, any question? Yeah, when you said the name Moshe, were the two sons of Moshe, literally? Yeah, and they became, they or the descendants became very great, because God said, I will make you great, even though Moshe Rabbeinu said, no, God said it. Uh, the Orachim talks about this, where it says, it's fascinating. And the other thing you said, that once Moshiach comes, there'll be no more babies born? No more what? Babies born. Well, it says that all the neshamas in the guf, which means that have to be born as, hum as a human being, when they are all born and there's nothing left in that section, Mashiach comes. Because it means the tikkun has been done. That's really what it is. Every Jewish neshama has a spot, so to speak, or region in the spheres that they can enlighten the spheres Right, raise the wattage, so to speak, and change their place. Yes, and uh, that's exactly what it is. And if a person doesn't do it once, he's got to come back, because that's his assignment. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, tikkun. Who? Uh, our tikkun, yeah. Doing all of the 
Yeah, well, the tikkun can be done in three ways. I, I, what'd you say, loud? Um, does there a tikkun involved doing all of the mitzvot um, plus we each have our individual tikkun that Hashem assigns each person? Mm -hmm. Well, e each person has to do the tanyag in different circumstances. Right? <clears throat> Men have their mitzvahs, women have theirs, but all of them have to do it within the scenario that is created for them. But they all have to do the taryag. Women have whatever they have to do, men. But the scenario that God puts you in, where you're a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman, that's the scenario you need to do the mitzvahs. You see? You know? I will tell you how you can do all the mitzvahs, even those that are not uh, available today. Lord Mishnais. It's a very interesting concept. Because it says, it's a medrash, rabba. It says, Ein haglulis miskansois. The way the, eg the exiles will only return. El Bishvil only because of the merit of Mishnais. The question is why? Because the Gemara, le the medrash learns out, it's a Gemara also, that if you, do a if you learn about the korbonus, sacrifices, the offerings, chattas. So the Medrash says, it's as if you brought a sacrifice. So they learn out, therefore, that learning has two functions. One is you learn, you get the mitzvah of Libana Torah, learning. And the second thing is that if you learn about it, it's as if you did it. Yeah, that's the power of learning. It's as if you did it. So therefore, if you learn Mishnayis, straight 4192 Mishnayas that's the whole oral law if you do that you will not only have learned the whole oral law but it's as if you will have done the oral law including all those mitzvahs that you know it seems that you uh, are not obligated that's a very interesting idea so I always tell a person look we all have we all sin and we're going to have to bring a lot of chattas a lot of sin offerings I said what do you have to spend a thousand dollars for a cow, right? You learn the learn the zvachim, that's all. It'll save you a lot of money. What can you say, right? It's a very practical idea, by the way. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. If you learn about chattas or ashram and oil and shlamim and all that, it will be as if you brought it. You have any idea how much money you could save? When the base of make this is around? What can you say? Wow, is that it? Thank you.